let's start that going. Um, and uh, we'll go ahead and get started today. We're gonna, I know that uh, reaction types um, is something that uh, a lot of people struggle with. And that was something that's uh, a pretty difficult, um, some of the concepts are pretty difficult, especially the way that classification works and kind of, um, so we're gonna spend some time reviewing that and reviewing the quizzes and answering your guys' quiz questions about the quiz. Um, and we'll keep practicing. The nice thing about this part of, of chemistry, one of the trickiest things about teaching this level of chemistry class is that sometimes it can seem like there's a whole bunch of topics that we're going to cover that aren't related to each other at all. And so it just feels like we're sort of skipping around, not really building the way that a math class does. Um, the nice thing about this part of the class is it does continue to build. And we can, now that we're talking about reactions, we can relate all of the different concepts we're talking about and kind of practice all of our different skills at the same time, Where, whether it's nomenclature, whether it's Vesper geometries, whether it's balancing reactions or classifying reactions. Um, you have a, a ton of practice problems now because every reaction that we talk about, you could use it to practice your Vesper geometries or you could use it to practice your nomenclature or your balancing or your classifications, et cetera. So um, as we're going through some examples, we're not gonna focus the entire lecture just on those topics, but any of the reactions that we get to in the second half of lecture when we're talking about this new topic, stoichiometry, um, definitely you can always feel free to like, oh, hey, is that, a, is that considered a redox reaction or not? And, we'll, and we could talk about that for any of these reactions we see. Um, all right, so let's, get into uh, quiz questions. We'll go through these. Um, so somebody asked about whether or not we need to determine the oxidizing agent or re um, reducing agent if we need it to be reaction be balanced first. And the answer for if we just want to know whether something's being oxidized or reduced, we do not need a balanced reaction. All we really need is to know whether or not um, we need to know we have the right compounds before and after. So making sure you have the right formulas before and after is important. But just knowing what the compounds are, not necessarily what their relation, you know, how many of each of them you have to make it balanced um, you in order to figure out whether something is a redox reaction or what's being oxidized or reduced. Um, as usual, I, I always get the, the single most common concept that I see. Um, hey, hang on to that thought is though, we'll go over that question in just a second when I finish um, my thought here, um, is uh, why is this useful? Why do we care about this? Um, this topic in particular, why does this topic matter? Um, and this and this person um, phrased it in a way that I hadn't seen as much. What type of reaction are most common in nature? Um, the answer for that one is really that it depends on where you look. Um, photosynthesis and digestion of um, sugars to make ATP are both redox reactions. So if you're looking at living cells, redox reactions wind up being very important. Acid-base reactions wind up being very important to living cells as well for different reasons. Um, peptide bond formation is an example of, a, of an acid, a form of acid-base reaction. Um, and, and also breaking apart peptide bonds so that you're, you don't wind up um, absorbing foreign proteins and having them catalyzing reactions in your body that your body doesn't want to have happen. Um, on the other hand, geology and geochemistry is almost entirely precipitation reactions. There's some oxidation and reduction stuff that happens, but for the most part, um, it's a whole bunch of mineral formation in general is mostly um, just phase changes and precipitation reactions. So it really depends on what field you're looking into. And that's one of the reasons why we kind of have these two, these broad categories, instead of having really specific types of reactions. So let's, let me go to the quiz for starters and we'll look at some of these questions. Um, a reminder with these questions, that most of what we care about is, is it a redox reaction or not? 
right? So the this top section, you're always going to be able to pick one of these two. I'm not always going to write it in this format, although I do kind of like this form, select all that apply sort of questions. Um, for all of these, all of them were either a complexation reaction, which are those Lego reactions where nothing is changing oxidation state, or it's a redox reaction where it is changing oxidation state. So even though there's a, a million and one other ways to classify chemical reactions, this is the broadest form. Is It's either a redox reaction or not. So on in terms of where we keep going through, through some of these, um, on the oxidizing agent, reducing agent, or neither question, um, if we're looking at this reaction and we want to see what's happening, for starters, we wanted to classify this as a reaction. As soon as we can look at this and recognize something is changing oxidation state, we know it's a redox reaction. Um, so in this case, aluminum starts with a charge of zero and then goes to a charge of plus three. Um, and so that tells us that if the aluminum starts as zero and goes to plus three, and I, I just cannot do this quickly with uh, with my mouse. So let me get my my um, stylus up and going here so I can note annotate this. So we're starting with our charge of zero on the aluminum and going to a charge of plus three. So that right there tells us um, that this is going to be a redox reaction. And if the aluminum is going from zero to plus three, then that's it's losing electrons. So we'd say that the aluminum is being oxidized. which makes it the reducing agent. Because if the aluminum is being oxidized, it's giving away those electrons. If it's giving away those electrons, something else has to be taking them. So the aluminum is the reducing agent because it is being oxidized. And the if we look on both sides of the reaction, we have sulfate and then we still have sulfate. Your sulfate was aqueous. It was dissolved in water to begin with, and then it went to being part of this solid. So we have a precipitation happening as well because we're making a solid. But the fact that we go, that sulfate starts as sulfate as SO4 two minus, and it ends, it's still SO4 two minus means nothing changed with the oxidation state. So if nothing changed with the oxidation state, then the sulfate is neither. It's not oxidizing agent or a reducing agent because its oxidation state is not changing at all. Which means by process of elimination, if we have a, re a reducing agent, we have to have an oxidizing agent. If we have something losing electrons, something else has to gain those electrons. So by process of elimination, once you see that, we can guess that this is going to be our oxidizing agent. But we can also see that in terms of what's happening here. The, the hydrogen starts as a plus one oxidation state, and it goes to elemental hydrogen, to hydrogen gas. So if it's going from plus one to zero, oxidation state of zero because it's neutral, then it went, if it went from plus one to zero, its charge was reduced. So we, would, we could say that the hydrogen ion is reduced, which makes it the oxidizing agent. 
because when you put the the H plus with the aluminum, the H plus causes the ox the aluminum to be oxidized. So the hydrogen is the oxidizing agent. The aluminum is the reducing agent. Um, and this is actually this reaction is also a good example of why I'm not a fan of some some of the of teaching reaction types exclusively exclusively as precipitation reactions or um, gas evolution reactions, because this reaction, it's a redox reaction where you are actually, where you actually form a precipitate because we are forming an ionic solid as a part of this reaction and we're forming gas. So this, we could consider this a precipitation reaction and a redox reaction and a gas evolution reaction all at the same time. Right, the, that's why the, biggest distinction is the is it i um is it a redox reaction or not because ga all gas evolution means is that over the course of the reaction you make a gas that can be a redox reaction that can be an acid base reaction that makes that has causes that to happen so it's gas evolution is just a description of a, of of uh, what's happening in the reaction, but it's not necessarily telling you what's going on when, when it comes to the compounds. And so, and like I mentioned before, um, if, you are, uh, if you are a biochemist, you're gonna have a totally different way of classifying these reactions. Um, if you are a engineer, you're gonna um, classify these reactions very differently. If you are a geologist, you're gonna classify reactions very differently. Um, and so, but they will all, all of those different fields, any field that deals with any chemical reactions whatsoever has to at some point differentiate between redox or not. So that's our umbrella, no matter what field you go into, knowing something is a redox or it's not a redox winds up being a useful distinction. And then as you go into other fields, you'll start narrowing it down. You know, when I teach OCHEM, there's a whole different classification of reactions. We still talk about oxidation and reduction reactions, but we also talk about um, isomerization reactions or rearrangement reactions um, or substitution reactions or elimination reactions. And those are all terms that don't get don't show up in other fields of chemistry as much. Right. So while there are some other reactions, um, descriptive terms for this class that are helpful, you'll continue adding to these distinctions as you go on and learn more science. Um, and the big one is that one, redox or not. Um, anytime you've got a metal being oxidized or reduced, then you can claim it was metal redox. Anytime that you um, are making a solid. If you start with no solids and you make a solid product, that could be considered a precipitation reaction, whether it's also redox or not. Um, so these are just descriptions of what's happening in the reaction, but that's not like it belongs exclusively to one category or another necessarily, which I recognize I, it's, um, it probably would be easier for you to understand um, and, and approach this topic if I just said straight up, memorize this. And this is all you have to do is memorize these definitions. Um, but the problem with that is that then the next time you take a chemistry class, I, it would be a case of, well, you were taught this last class and now you have to unlearn it and relearn a better way to think about it. Um, so I'm trying to both make it palatable and understandable at the level where you guys are right now, as well as making it so that you're not, I'm not teaching you something that's wrong that you'll have to unlearn next time. All right, let's see, there was a couple other questions I wanted to, oh, neutralization. Neutralization, um, generally is a synonym for acid-base reactions. Technically, it's a little bit more specific neutralization means usually that you have an acid acidic solution and a basic solution 
And when you mix them together, you get something that is less acidic and less basic. They kind of cancel each other out. Hence the term neutralize. They're um, neutralizing each other. Um, I think acid base reaction is a more descriptive term, what's going on. So I'll continue to use that, but I want you to have seen that term neutralization because it will also show up. Neutralization, when you see neutralization in chemistry, you should just think acid base. See, for all intents and purposes right now, it's the same thing. <clears throat> um, and like I said before, with uh, gas evolution, anytime you don't have any gases on the reactant side and you make a gas, that's a gas evolution reaction. And there's a lot of different ways that can look. Um, for instance, if anybody's ever done a science fair project when you were in middle school or helped your siblings or kids do a science fair project um, in middle school, what's the classic chemistry reaction in a um, middle school science fair? Usually related to geology, kind of, kind of. Volcano. Baking soda and vinegar, right? That's a guess of evolution reaction. That is not a redox reaction. <clears throat> um, baking soda and vinegar. Baking soda is sodium hydrogen carbonate. Um, and you can do it as a solid or as a solution. If you're just dumping baking soda in, then usually you would have it as a solid. Plus, um, vinegar is acetic acid, which is acetate with a hydrogen in front of it as a solution, so aqueous. When you react those together, you make CO2 and water and sodium acetate. So the sodium acetate is still aqueous. That's supposed to say aqueous. I tried to get to clean that up. And then I hit clear instead of my eraser. So the sodium acetate stays aqueous, the CO2 is a gas, and the water is a liquid. So if you actually look at all of the oxidation states before and after, um, nothing is changing oxidation states. We're making a gas through an acid-base reaction. It's really kind of two acid-base reactions happening sequentially. Um, but the net result is we make a gas, but nothing changes oxidation state. So this is a gas evolution reaction. Um, but it's so gas evolution reaction and precipitation reaction don't necessarily mean that it's not that it is or isn't a redox reaction. Right? So I, when I'm assigning partial credit for questions like a select all that apply, the bulk of the points is, do you get this one right? And then can you further describe the reaction with some of these other terms we've used? Right, and there's a lot of different ways to, to do that. So um, these are the most common ones we're looking at in this class. We'll add to this vocabulary as you keep going in, in science. Any other reaction type questions here? Any specifics on here that you didn't get? When the, hopefully you guys saw the answers when you submitted your quizzes so that you could get some feedback on that. But was there any that didn't make sense to you once you saw the, the right answers that you didn't know why that was the right answer? Okay, then we'll do some more practice with those here in a second. A um, couple other random questions. Some I said an aqueous solution is something dissolved in water, but you 
but can you have something have it dissolved in something else can you have a different solvent and still have it be a solution um we wouldn't call it aqueous if it's aqueous aqueous by definition means that you're using water as the solvent um because water is the most common solvent on on earth and the one that we see the most commonly both in labs and in the real life um that's the only solvent that we have its own abbreviation for you know if if we were doing chemistry in a completely different environment or if chemistry developed in a completely different planet, you know, I'm trying, I'm thinking, um, I don't remember which of the, is one of the moons of Jupiter has uh, liquid methane or not liquid methane. Um, well, there is one that has liquid methane, but there's also one that has liquid ammonia instead of liquid water. Um, where you know if life developed there and developed their own chemistry system they might have an abbreviation for something dissolved in ammonia because that would be the most common solvent in those in that environment um so for us aqueous means in water and if it was something else um then we would describe it differently so for instance uh shoot would they call that what's that throat spray um, that you, when you have a sore throat and you spray it in your throat, it makes you gag for a second, but then the back of your throat goes numb for a little bit and then doesn't, doesn't feel so bad. It's, it's sepical or something. Chloroseptic, uh, I think. There you go, chloroseptic. Um, and uh, there's a couple different versions, but in particular, they, um, the kind that you spray in the back is actually a compound called phenol that's dissolved in usually ethanol, which is drinking alcohol. <clears throat> um, so you, that would be a case of phenol spray. 1% phenol spray as, an, as the active ingredient, um, usually in ethanol, meaning drinking alcohol. That's an example of a solution that's not water-based that actually you would see in a fairly regular um, circumstances like you know you can go to the store and, and if you look on the label it, it will say 1.4 percent phenol in ethanol it wouldn't but if it was in water it would say 1.4 percent aqueous phenol just so it, it just sort of depends on the situation aqueous is the only one for us for us aqueous always means in water and then last but not least um what would happen if we were if we didn't balance a reaction and we were trying to use that reaction in the lab um we're going to talk about why balancing is helpful today but it, it has to do with the stoichiometry um the reaction wouldn't be wrong necessarily be qualitatively it'd still be the right reaction if you still have the right reactants in the right products if you have the right compounds on both sides then it's the same reaction but the difference is is that if you if you don't have it balanced, then you could wind up making a, a lot more of a hazardous product than you were expecting. If we know, for instance, that, that there's a certain reaction that makes carbon monoxide, um, and you think that it's a one-to-one -one ratio because you didn't balance the reaction right, and you think, okay, I'm making a little bit of carbon monoxide, but I can just do it in the fume hood and it's going to be fine, or you know, open a window and I'm going to be fine. But if it was actually making it five to one ratio, you could pretty easily wind up making way more carbon monoxide than your open window or your fume hood could handle. And you could, you could find yourself in a dangerous situation. Um, even though you were already expecting that compound to be there, sometimes the amount can be what makes, makes a dangerous situation. Um, that, is, that is a good question that I had not seen before, that I had not thought about it that way. Um, if you don't have the reaction balance, can that really make a situation dangerous? And after I thought about it a little bit, I think so. Mostly, though, balancing reactions is going to be really helpful when it comes to figuring out how much product we can make and figuring out how much of our reactants get used up. That's going to be the number one place we see it. So let's go through these four reactions for practice balancing and um, classifying them. So for each of them, figure out if it's a redox or not, and then think of any other terms you could apply to it. 
and then uh, balance it. Make sure it's all squared away that way. I'll give you a few minutes to. And while you're working on this, um, Gina, I will also bring up that anybody who is still um, still at LTCC next year and wants to get some some um, physical experience doing labs, a real in-person labs next year, we will be fully face to face next year. Um, and if, so if you're taking the Gen Chem series, you're going to do all the lab, pretty much all the labs we would have done in this class, um, just in a slightly more in-depth version next year. So you'll get, you are not missing out on anything if you're taking the Gen Chem series next year, um, then doing this lab, these labs virtual is not going to hurt your experience at all. Um, but if you're not planning on taking the Gen Chem series and you still want to get some experience in labs, um, you can audit. Chem 100's labs next year for free. You just have to pick a lab section that's not full. Um, as long as there's not a waiting list, you can sign up to audit any of our classes at LTCC for free. You just don't get any additional credit. It won't show up on your transcript at all. Um, so if you, but if you wanted to come do some of the labs or all the labs, just just to get experience in the lab, if you're here and have the time, that's an option next year. Um, so let me know if you are interested in that. Um, we won't be offering Chem 100 again until next spring. Um, so, but if you're here next spring and you want to hang out in lab, that would be um, that would be an option. You just have to pick which section you're in to make sure that we don't have we're not over full. I have a question, Sean. All right. Yeah, Dana. Are there support classes offered um, for the chemistry? I know they don't probably won't count as credit or like go onto a transcript, but are there support classes that are offered for the higher level chem classes? We have not done that since I've been at LTCC. I, I've heard that before I was here, there was a class, but it never actually ran because it didn't have enough enrollment. Okay. Um, so, okay. but what we do, what we do have is that the, um, Gen Chem series, the classes are all 5.75 units, which is an odd number, but the extra units that you get um, is basically goes to having an extra lab meeting a week that we either use to finish up labs or more commonly we use it to, as to do group work. Uh, it's what's called a recitation, meaning that it's basically a chance for you guys to ask me questions and work on practice problems with me. It's not usually a le additional lecture, but it's more time with me to work on stuff. So in that respect, we kind of have it built into the class a little bit. Okay, cool. Thanks. No problem. All right. So let's start going through some of these and talking about them. Um, this first one, if we wanted to practice naming these, OH with a negative charge is hydroxide. So we're mixing barium hydroxide and this other molecule is potassium oxalate oxalate c2o4 with a negative two charge was i think it was on our polyatomic list as oxalate um, if you mix potassium oxalate solution and a barium hydroxide solution you make barium oxalate which is insoluble in water so we're mixing together two solutions to make a solid product. And we still, everything still has the same oxidation state on both sides. You have oxalate here. We're making oxalate on the other side. We have hydroxide and hydroxide. We have barium with a two plus and barium with a two plus. 
we have potassium with a plus one and potassium with a plus one. So the fact that everything, you can look on both sides and there's nothing is changing identity, there's no charges um, changing from left to right tells us it's not a redox reaction. So that's gonna be one of those complexation or Lego reactions we're just taking apart the pieces and putting them back together in a different way. More specifically, we wanted to apply some of those other terms to it. Um, this would be a precipitation um, and a lot of times frequently we refer to the solid that we make is called the precipitate um, or just PPT for short. So we could refer to this barium oxalate compound that we were making as the precipitate. Um, and you can really, it's, you can think about these like precipitation in meteorology. It's, it's different context, but it kind of seems similar. Precipitation in meteorology is when you have moisture coming out of the air and it form, starts forming water droplets, right? You start making something larger um, and then it falls, falls to the earth. Um, in chemistry, precipitation is when you, you put the right ions together, they stick together and become um, too heavy to stay dissolved in the water and wind up falling to the bottom as well. Um, so there's some similarities. There's a reason there, the term is, shows up in both places. Um, it's definitely not um, a gas evolution reaction because there's no gases there. We're not making any gases. And it's not an acid-base reaction because no, there are no hydrogens changing hands. There are no hydrogen ions moving from one compound to another. Um, so these would be the two best ways to describe this one. If we were balancing it, we'd look at it and say, okay, well, I've got two potassiums on the left. So I'm probably probably gonna need to put a two there. I've got one oxalate on the left, I've got one oxalate on the right. So oxalates are balanced. I've got one barium on the left, I've got one barium on the right. So barium is balanced. I have two hydroxides on the left and two hydroxides on the right. So my hydroxides are balanced. So to balance this one, all we had to do was put the two in front of the potassium hydroxide. And that also, I'll also point out that if it's not a redox reaction, if you still have all the same ions on both sides, then you don't need to balance the oxygens and the hydrogen separately. You can just balance it in terms of hydroxides. Because if all of the hydroxide ions from the left are still hydroxide in, when they're products, there's no need to break it down into oxygens and hydrogens, just balance it as hydroxides and oxalates for these polyatomics. Right, so balancing the um, non-redox reactions, the complexation reactions is usually significantly easier because you don't need to break it down all the way. If we're looking at the next example, which is iron oxide, iron three oxide reacts with metal aluminum to make iron metal and aluminum oxide. Um, this is actually a reaction that's a kind of a famous reaction called thermite. A thermite reaction um, is just if you mix the right ratios of iron three oxide, which is rust with powdered aluminum, um, it's really hard to start the reaction happening. You have to get it really, really hot. Usually use um, burning magnesium metal um, to start this process, but it's the most exothermic reaction in existence, essentially, that's you know, until we start getting into nuclear reactions um, to the point where if you could do something like make a pile the size of a golf ball on the hood of a car and it would melt through the engine block. Um, they used to use this to weld railroad ties together in the in the uh, old west um, 
because you could just pack, you'd pack these iron railroad ties together and you'd pack the space between them with this thermite mixture and start the reaction and it would literally weld the railroad ties together. Um, plus we're making iron, metal, metallic iron as a product. So that also had the advantage of you were actually adding some iron metal in there too. So um, just a little historical perspective on this reaction. Is it going to be redox or complexation? Redox. Yeah, you've got aluminum starts with a charge of zero, goes to a charge of plus three. That iron starts with a charge of plus three and goes to a charge of zero. So the iron is being reduced, the aluminum is being oxidized. And aluminum, it turns out aluminum um, is oxidizes very, very easily. So aluminum is actually a really common, really powerful um, reducing agent. When you put aluminum with most any other metal ions, it will reduce those metal ions back to their neutral state. Um, and it winds up being a pretty fast and energetic reaction. The powdered aluminum is also used as rocket fuel for dry fuel boosters. Um, I don't know if they're still using aluminum, um, but originally back in the 60s when they had those, um, those big rocket boosters they would put on the outside of the, the space shuttle launches, the big orange tank was a liquid fuel tank, but those white um, boosters that they would put on either side of the big orange tank um, were solid fuel boosters. And they us usually used a powdered aluminum based fuel, solid fuel. Um, so that also gives you some, some idea why we use the term reducing agent, because that, that allows us to talk about aluminum as a compound, say, well, aluminum is a pretty good reducing agent because it'll, it'll reduce pretty much anything else you put with it. Just in the context of one reaction, it's a little bit harder to see why that's a useful term, but it allows us to make some, some descriptions of these different compounds as well. So this would be redox. We're not making any gases, so we wouldn't call it a gas evolution reaction. We don't have a solid, we start with all solids and we still have solids, so we wouldn't call it a precipitation reaction. It's not a combustion reaction really because it's not carbon based. So redox or metal redox, metal metal redox um, would be the, the best way to describe this. As you far as balancing how, goes. Yeah. Sorry, can you explain how you got the charges? Like why, why is the, um, Iron oxide plus three. Why is aluminum no charge? Yes. So anything that's in its in its elemental state, meaning it's by itself and it's neutral, is always going to be zero. So okay. aluminum starts as zero because it's by itself and it's neutral. So it has to have a chart, an oxidation state of zero in order to make it overall charge of zero. And same with the iron over here. Um, the others, the oxides, we can we can work out because well, although iron can have multiple different oxidation states, it's with oxygen, and oxygen is pretty much always going to be a negative two. The only time oxygen's not a negative two is when it's O two as a gas. For the most part, there are a couple of exceptions as well, like hydrogen peroxide, um, but. For the most part, we're always going to assume that oxygen is a negative two. And so if oxygen is a negative two, and there's three of them, that gives us a total of negative six on the iron oxide, which means that the iron metal has to be plus three. And then same, we do the exact same process for the aluminum on the other side. And so oxidation states for, 
or ionic compounds are usually pretty easy. It's not until you get covalent bonds involved that it starts getting tricky. It's the same as just our charges. Um, as far as balancing this, if we just start by looking like at iron, well, I've got two irons over here. Therefore, I know I have to make at least two iron atoms on the right-hand side. And I'm making aluminum oxide, which has two aluminums. So I know I've got to have at least two aluminums here. And once we do that, if we then look at the oxygens, you see we have three oxygens on the left, three oxygens on the right. So that's all we need to do to balance it is to put those two twos on there, those coefficients of two on the metals. And I know I, I scared you a bit by um, giving you some really tough examples of balancing reactions, but in general, balancing reactions is not, not going to be the hardest part of these problems usually. And balancing the reactions, once you get the hang of it, most of them balance pretty quickly and easily once you start seeing some of the patterns. All right, let's look at this next one where we've got hydrogen perchlorate um, compound. This, this would be perchloric acid, would be the acidic name, but we haven't learned that nomenclature yet. So we can just think of it as being an ionic compound where we've got hydrogen with a plus one, and then we've got chlorate, or sorry, perchlorate, And then we still have perchlorate on the other side. So we have a hydrogen ion with perchlorate, and then we still have perchlorate. We have this um, NH3 compound, the common name of which is, is ammonia, but we can look at it. Um, in terms of oxidation states. Um, if we have the nitrogen is more electronegative than hydrogen, so we're, we would sit, satisfy the nitrogen first. So the nitrogen would have a negative three charge, which would mean the hydrogen would have to be plus one since there's three of them. And if we look over here, if we ignore the, per, the perchlorate, since we have perchlorate on both sides, we're pretty sure that that's not being oxidized or reduced, right? The chlorine is, we still have the same chlorine oxygen configuration on both sides. So that's not being oxidized or reduced. So if anything is being oxidized or reduced, it's going to be either the nitrogen or the hydrogen. And once again, if we look at this polyatomic ion, the NH4, well, that's with a plus charge, that's ammonium. And if all of the if the nitrogen has to be satisfied first, the nitrogen is going to be negative three, which means how do we get four hydrogens to have the same charge and have that charge add up to a plus one overall? Well, each of the hydrogens is going to be a plus one. So our nitrogen didn't change oxidation states. Our hydrogen was all plus one before and after. Our perchlorate is still perchlorate, which means none of its oxidation states changed. So the fact that, that you can look at both sides and see all the same atoms, all with the same oxidation states, tells us it must not be redox. This is definitely not redox. So complexation or Lego, I'll even accept that, a Lego reaction. And if we wanted to get more specific with this, we could look at it and say, okay, well, if you take the H plus and you stick it onto the NH3, that gives you NH4. Sorry, NH4 with a positive charge. All we did is we took an H plus away from the perchlorate and gave it to the nitrogen. 
no oxidation states changed. We just moved an H plus from one thing to another. So that's a textbook example of an acid base reaction. All we did is take an H plus and move it from one compound to the other. Um, and the way, one of the ways we can see that is if you can look at this from one side to the other and see, okay, well, my nitrogen is, I still have nitrogen in both cases. I just added an extra hydrogen to it. So this would also be an, a neutralization reaction. Um, I just use the term acid base because it's more broad and more descriptive of the fact we have an acid and a base reacting. Um, but anytime you can look at a compound and say, okay, well, all I did was I took this NH3 and I stuck an H plus on it to make, to make it NH4 plus. That's what I mean by a hydrogen ion transfer, an H plus transfer. And that's a classic example of, a, of an acid base reaction. The number, if you can find that happening, it's an acid base reaction. Right, so there might also be other things happening in, in a complicated reaction, but anytime you can identify on both sides that all you did was move, add an H plus or take away an H plus from a compound, that's always going to be an acid base reaction. So some other really common ones, um, if you go from hydroxide to water, or if you go from, um, if you go from hydrogen sulfate to sulfate. You go from hydrogen sulfate to sulfate, all we did was take away an H plus. It's still a sulfate before and after, it's just missing an H plus. And going back the other way would still be a good example. Water forming hydroxide is an acid, gonna be an acid base reaction or sulfate accepting an H plus to become hydrogen sulfate. All right, so polyatomics are a really good way to, to spot these, because if you can recognize your polyatomic ions on both sides, it becomes a lot easier to see, oh, I just tacked on an extra H plus there. Are, are these two equations you just, they're not balanced? No, no. So I'm just saying that, so you will always, just like if you have something oxidized, you always have to have something reduced. Okay. If you have something that gives up an H plus, it always has to go somewhere. So those are just sort of half of a re reaction. I could do, actually we could do this. If you do H2O plus sulfate and let it react, it'll make hydroxide and hydrogen sulfate. So those two examples I just said, they're, they're kind of working together here. One of them has got to give up an H plus, the other one accepts it. But as soon as you can, you can pinpoint, oh, that's a sulfate and that's a sulfate with an H plus, that tells you it's an acid base reaction. Um, a lot of times you will either be starting or ending with an acid, meaning an ionic compound where you've got hydrogen as your um, positive charge. So for instance, sulfuric acid is H2SO4. If you start with sulfuric acid and then you don't have sulfuric acid at the e end, if you wind up making, say, sulfate, well, sulfate is just sulfuric acid missing its hydrogens, right? So Again, that's if you start with an acid and then you don't have the acid on the other side, that's also a pretty good clue that it's an acid base reaction. Okay, let's look at this last one. Oh, as far as balancing, do we need to do anything to balance this acid base reaction? No, we start with per one perchlorate on the left. We have one perchlorate on the right. We have one nitrogen on the left, one nitrogen on the right. 
Now, all we did was we moved one H plus over there, right? So we have four hydrogens total on the left and we still have four hydrogens total on the right. Um, and we will also frequently see that with acid base reactions. A lot of acid base reactions wind up being one to one. Everything is gonna have a coefficient of one because all you're doing is moving one H plus around. All right, this last one, one of the easiest types to recognize, right? I said it enough times, um, but just to reiterate, you start with carbons and hydrogens together and you make CO2 in water, it's always combustion. Oxygen's always gonna be the other reactant and you're always gonna make CO2 in water. And in real world situations, if you had a compound that wasn't just hydrogens and carbon, and you might make some other compound, like if you try to burn an amino acid that has that has uh, nitrogen in it, you wind up making you know nitrogen dioxide or something as a byproduct, and that would be added to the end here. Um, or if you if anything that has sulfur in it burns, you wind up making sulfur dioxide as a byproduct along with your CO two and water. Um, but you will always have at least CO two and water if it's a combustion reaction. Um, and that makes it a redox reaction. And we can see it if we look at the oxidation states before and after. So if you look at your oxidation state for oxygen beforehand, got a charge of zero on it, right? It's in its elemental state, it's neutral, so it has to have a charge of zero. And on the other side, you have oxygen mixed in with carbons and hydrogens, and oxygen's more electronegative than either of those. So in both of those cases, for CO2 and for the water, the oxygen's negative two. So the oxygen goes from zero to negative two. So the oxygen is being reduced. This is actually where the term oxidation comes from, because Oxygen is the most common oxidizing agent on Earth. If you put oxygen gas with pretty much anything that has electrons it can lose, oxygen will take them and become reduced. So oxygen is reduced very frequently, which means it's oxidizing whatever you put it with. And if we look at our oxidation states on the other side, um, Organic compounds, carbon-based compounds, sometimes you don't wind up with a whole number. Um, each of the hydrogens has got to be a plus one, and there's eight of them, which means the carbons have, there's three carbons, and each carbon has to be a negative charge, right? Negative, well, negative uh, eight over three the easiest way to do it and not have to do the, the fraction in my head. Um, on the other side, the carbon and CO2, we need that to add up to a charge of zero, right? And if there's two oxygens and they're each negative two in CO2, that means the carbon has to be plus four. And your hydrogens don't really wind up changing. Your hydrogens were um, plus one on one side, and they're still going to be plus one on this side. So your carbon is being oxidized. Your oxygen is being reduced. And again, when I when I first wrote this slide and wrote out these reactions, I was not planning on doing the oxidation states for the combustion one, which is why I gave you an example where it's not a whole number. Usually on the examples, at least on the test, if I'm asking you to do a, a assign oxidation states, I'll give you something that'll wind up being a whole number. Um, so if, you, if we did um, methane CH4, for instance, it would wind up with an oxidation state of negative four on the carbon. Um, it just has to do with the fact you actually have two different types of carbons in, in propane. 
Um, but again, now we're getting into organic chemistry. And those of you who need to take organic chemistry will hear me talk about that at length when you get to that class. So don't worry about that for now. Um, we just, but we can look at it and say for sure, we know that the carbon started out negative because it had to balance out the, the hydrogens. And now the carbon is positive. So in other words, the carbon had to lose electrons to do that. All right, let's balance this and then we'll take our break and we'll get into doing some stoichiometry practice, reactions practice. So if we wanted, if you want to balance a combustion reaction, generally the way to do it is assume that you're going to have a one in front of your carbon-based compound and you're going to leave the oxygens for last um, because we can add oxygens without changing anything else, right? So balance your carbons and hydrogens and then worry about your oxygens. So if we have one propane molecule, we make three CO2s and four waters. So we have a total of eight hydrogens to work with. And if we do that, if we total up all of our oxygens now. Three times two is six oxygens here and four oxygens there. So we need a total of 10 oxygen atoms. So that's an even number. That's a good thing, right? Because we have O2 on the other side. So we have to have an even number of oxygens. And so if we want a total of 10 oxygen atoms, we need five O2s. Isabella? I have kind of like a crazy question. OK, well, we're okay. just before break, so that's the perfect time for a crazy question. If it's really crazy, I'll have everybody else go to break, and then we'll talk about it. OK, may I ask it? Yeah, please. OK, so I see that there's five, three, four. And like somewhere in the back of my brain, it's like, OK, is that like a Pythagorean like perfect triangle or something? or? Um, does that mean it has like a triagonal planar like molecular shape? Do, like, does does any of that make sense? If I'm, <laughs> I like I like that you started looking to try and make a relationship between these these numbers, these coefficients here. Um, but no, unfortunately, there's not. This is not a good way that we could we could get into trigonal planar. It seems like because <laughs> it's also geometric numbers, but. Um, because all it would take to change this is if this is just means for for propane specifically, this is what happens when you burn it. But if you took it and if you added one oxygen, you could make it C3H8O, which is isopropyl alcohol, rubbing alcohol. Rubbing alcohol will also burn, but it's not going to be with the same coefficients. So just just it's always going to be dependent on what are you starting with. And it's not always, they're always going to be whole number ratios, but not necessarily five, three, four, nice, clean Pythagorean numbers. Sweet. Thank you for entertaining that idea. I appreciate it. I like that. I like crazy questions like that. That's fun. Um, all right, let's take a break. Let's do 10 minutes and then uh, we'll come back at 2.40 and we will get into doing some calculations with these.
All right, as everybody's making their way back over here and getting getting ready to go again, Just one more practice with oxidizing agent, reducing agent. So give this give this a go for a few minutes, and we'll go over it real quick. All right, so let's go ahead and go through this. I have the oxidation states labeled on the reaction here. Um, so the red is for the sodium. The sodium starts out with a charge, a neutral charge, and then goes to um, a plus one charge when it becomes sodium ion. So the sodium. Is being oxidized um, and then the oxygen we can see has a negative two charge when it says water it also has a negative two charge as hydroxide if you look at the oxidation state so for any of these polyatomic ions you can do the oxidation state of the ion you don't need to to do it all as one big um, ionic compound. So for hydroxide, you still have oxygen is still the most electronegative element there. So it's still going to be a negative two to become most stable. And the hydrogen would be a plus one still. So our hydroxide, in our hydroxide, neither the oxygen nor the hydrogen changed oxidation states. Um, so this is also a good example because this is a case of we have two products that have hydrogen. One of in one of those products in the hydroxide, the oxidation state doesn't change. The other, the other um, hydrogen product, you you have hydrogen going from plus one to zero, so that's a reduction. Remember, Leo says GER. The other way to remember it is oil rig. Which stands for oxidation is loss. Reduction is gain. So if you're oxidized, oxidation is losing an electron and re reduction is gaining an electron. I like Leo Lyon says GER myself but um, to each their own. So we have the hydrogen is being reduced. The sodium metal is being oxidized, which means Na is the reducing agent. Remember, we talked about how 
how aluminum is really good re um, reducing agent because it's oxid oxidized so easily. Sodium is an even better reducing agent than aluminum, right? So again, these, these terms allow us to compare various elements to each other, various compounds to each other um, in a helpful way. And then we could also say that the water is the oxidizing agent. All right, and the that would make mean that the oxygen is neither being oxidized or reduced. All right, we feeling feeling a little bit better on oxidizing on oxidation states and and recognizing these a little bit. Uh, we went really fast at the end of uh, last week's lectures to kind of get ready for this stuff. Um, so you might have been a little bit shaky on it when you when you did the homework or took the quiz, but we'll keep practicing it. All right, we're going to skip these. Now, this is actually good practice, though, for um, taking a verbal or a written description of a chemical reaction and translating it into a chemical reaction written as a chemical reaction. So solid potassium chlorate decomposes to form solid potassium chloride and diatomic oxygen gas. That's everything you need to be able to rewrite this as a, as a reaction and then balance it. Um, and same, so for, we're gonna leave these alone for now, but um, I'd be happy to go over some of these in uh, office hours or um, give you a, a key if you go through and work on these and wanna know if you got your answers right or not. All right, um, we did. We just balanced this reaction right before break. Um, yeah, I, I think it, it is good for getting you used to um, polyatomic ion names and just how do you go from back and forth between between the, you know, this is a useful in terms of balancing it, but it's not very useful in terms of describing to somebody else what's happening verbally or in writing even. Right, being able to say propane gas reacts with oxygen to make CO2 and water, and then be able to take that and turn it into a balanced chemical reaction is a useful skill. So for this one, if we wanted to go back and balance it, it was one, five, three, and four. Um, if we wanna know how many moles are in five pounds of propane, just as a review, since we've been dealing all conceptual stuff. Um, if we wanna know, these, this is balanced in terms of atoms and moles, right? It's not balanced in terms of grams. So if we wanna be able to compare these, these um, compounds to each other, we need to get everything in moles first. So for starters, let's remember how to do that. If you have five, let's make that, 5.0 pounds of propane of C3H8, how many moles of propane is that? Give that a go and we'll work through it. All right, so anytime we want to get from a mass to moles, we need to go through grams because then we can use the molecular weight. 
Um, so convert pounds to grams, start by here. So we start by, we know we're gonna start by doing pounds to grams. So use your conversion sheet to figure out um, pounds to grams. We use that four point or 453.59 grams of one pound. Then we wanna to go to grams, grams to moles. This is where we're gonna use the, the molecular formula. It's three, C3H8, that means one mole of this compound is going to have three moles of carbon and eight moles of hydrogen. So we're just going to take pieces and add them up, which going from just uh, whole numbers here, since I'm doing it in my head, it's going to be 36 plus eight. Um, so we'll get something like 44 point 44.11, maybe. Um, Alan just put in the chat that it's 44.094. Thanks to both of you. So then we're just gonna be able to plug that in here. That's grams for every mole, right? Grams per mole, so. For every 44.09 grams, it's one mole of C3HA. And so getting to number of molecules as moles is going to wind up being a really important part of this class because that's how we balance the reaction, is not according to how many grams of, of each compound we have or we make. It's in terms of how many molecules. Oh. Right, so our final answer here would be something like, hmm, 200, what are we gonna get? And again, writing it out this way is always going to be helpful because anytime somebody says, I'm just supposed to divide by the density or I'm supposed to multiply by the molecular weights, I don't know unless we look at the units and how they cancel out. Because sometimes we're going to want to multiply by the molecular weight and sometimes divide by the molecular weight according to what makes the units cancel out. Five times four, five, nine divided by 44.09. 51 moles. Of propane. All right, so that's just getting us back into thinking about doing these calculations because those grams to mole calculations are going to continue to be important. Um, and hopefully you already watched the brief intro to stoichiometry from last week's lab um, video. Um, but, so we're going to keep going through how to do some of these calculations using an analogy um, where we, instead of having um, chemicals, we're going to talk about pieces of a car, making a car, because I found that thinking about things that are as abstract as chemical reactions gets really tricky unless we have a, a really good analogy we can compare it to as that we can visualize. So if we think about four more most important pieces of a car, at least in my mind, when I think of a car, what I think of are wheels, doors, engine, and chassis or frame. If you put all of that together, you could make a car. Well, but we don't need just one of each of these, right? If we're trying to make a car, 
we want to, we need the right number of each of these, right? So this is analogous to balancing our chemical reaction. We're building a car and it's not a motorcycle or some sort of weird clown car with only three wheels. We're going to need four wheels, right? So just like balancing reactions, it's all based on co conservation mass. If I want to make a car with four wheels, I need four wheels to do it. Um, if I'm making a coupe, which is a two door, I need two doors. I need one engine and I need one frame, one chassis. And so, and if I put all that together, I get one product, one coupe. So, easy enough when we're thinking about things we can picture. You can do this with food or recipes. You can do this with, um, you know, I, I like to use hamburgers, also a good analogy a lot. Um, you know, to make a hamburger, you need two pieces of bread and one piece and one patty, right? Or, and if you're me, then three pieces of cheese. Um, so, you know, take something that you can turn into its components and think about these chemical reactions like this. This is just a recipe, basically in order to start from some material and make something else. Where this gets really useful is we need, we didn't balance this according to the weight of the wheels, right? We need four wheels, it doesn't matter what they weigh. Um, this is going to allow us to do things just like our molecular weight, where we can say, okay, if you have 250 pounds of wheels, how many cars can you make? This is going to allow us to come up with those, those conversions that allow us to say, okay, well, for every four wheels equals one car, or two doors, means I need to use four wheels. Every time I use two doors, I also use four wheels, right? These, if you have a balanced reaction, any combination of the coefficients can be used to write a conversion. And that's gonna allow us to convert back and forth between different types of objects or different compounds. It always does that. Um, for whatever reason, PowerPoint does that sometimes. So if you have the information we put here, let me re go back and rebalance it now that I'm through fighting Excel or uh, PowerPoint. How much does one coupe weigh? How much does one car weigh? If we're using these, let's assume that there's no, no other pieces to the car. We're not, we're departing from reality a little bit there. If I wanna know how many, how much one car weighs, I can just take, put all the pieces together, right? I know that one car is going to be four wheels, two doors, an engine, and a chassis. If we wanted to add all of that up, that's just like finding our molecular weight. We're just going to take all of these pieces and add them up. Four wheels times 15 kilograms per wheel. So 60 plus 50 plus 185 plus 800. Thank you, Alan. And all of our numbers are going to the tenths place. So when we add them up, we will also go to the tenths place. Right. so this is, part of this is just showing conservation of mass. Whatever you have on the reactant side, you have to have on the product side, if it's balanced. And it's, the other part of this is I'm just trying to make the point that um, 
we're not necessarily going to have the same number of molecules before and after. Before we put our car together, we had four wheels, two doors, one engine, and one chassis, right? We had a total of eight objects, eight separate things. And once we put them together, we only have one thing. So having a balanced reaction and considering conservation of mass does not mean we're going to have the same number of molecules before and after. We can have reactions where we make, where you take a bunch of pieces and turn it into one big molecule that we call a synthesis. That'd be a, an example of a synthesis reaction. So this is an analogy for a synthesis. Synthesis just means putting stuff together to make something. On the other hand, you could have a decomposition reaction. If you think of a car that's been, been around for 50 years sitting in somebody's front yard, there's a, there's a pretty decent chance that one or more of those pieces is no longer there, right? You took one entire car and turned it into separate pieces over the course of 50 years as you part it out. That would be an example of a decomposition reaction. So like decomposing, like anything decomposing. Decomposition. Make sure I don't leave out a syllable. You can end up with more pieces than you started with. You can end up with fewer pieces than you started with, but the mass has to be the same. No matter whether I'm taking a bunch of separate pieces and putting them together or taking one object and breaking it up, I still have the same mass before and after. I still have the same number of atoms before and after. They're just arranged differently. Right, so in terms of Um, chemical reactions, conservation of mass means you have the same number of atoms before and after. It does not mean you have the same number of molecules. So if we have a balanced reaction, two, two silver plus sulfur turns into silver sulfide. Before and after this reaction, if we add up all our reactants before and we add up all of our products, we're going to wind up with the mass adding up to the same on both sides but we went from having two separate compounds to having one compound over the course of this reaction. And just like taking separate pieces and putting them together to make a car means we have one object at the end of it. And we started with separate objects. All right, so let's do a practice with chemicals instead of with cars. So if we have aluminum reacting with bromine to make aluminum bromide, or we can do anything mathematically, we have to balance this and then try to answer these questions using the coefficients. So I'll give you a couple minutes to do that practice. John, I have a question. <laughs> Hit me. Um, can you tell me what would be the doors and what would be the car? Would the aluminum be like the parts? Um, just like relate the analogy you gave me, but can you relate it to the specific question just so I make sure I'm on the same page? Um, the the balancing is going to make it look funny. So let's pretend we don't have any coefficients there yet. But okay. you could think of the aluminum as being the chassis and, and the bromine being the wheels. Okay, okay. Right, that's, once we balance it, that kind of falls apart because we need to wind up doing a two here on the right-hand side, et cetera. Okay. Which means a two there and a three there. And so it's a little bit harder to come up with something that requires a two to three ratio. Got it. So maybe aluminum, maybe we're making a tricycle 
and aluminum is uh, aluminum is pedals and bromine is wheels. And so the main thing is once we get it balanced, we can compare any of these pieces to each other just the same way as we could say two doors requires four wheels. We can say for every two aluminums we use, we need three bromines. So for every, for how many moles of aluminum does it take to react with three moles of bromine? Well, if I have three moles of bromine and every, and we're just gonna use these coefficients from up here for every three moles of bromine, I needed two moles of aluminum react. So in our tricycle analogy, every time I use three wheels, I need to use two pedals. Is really what we're saying here. We're talking about the individual parts that are coming together to make a product. And if we do that, we wind up with, okay, well, we want to set it up so moles of bromine will cancel out moles of bromine. And moles of bromine cancels out moles of bromine. Our units that are left now are moles of aluminum. So we'd wind up with three moles of bromine means, I'm just writing it backwards since I leave myself space, two moles of aluminum. So for every three moles of bromine react, two moles of aluminum react. Could we have- And we can set it up and- Go ahead. Sorry. Could we have just came to that answer by balancing the equation and not- We doing... could in this case. Okay. This is, this is just like with conversions where I started you off with stuff that you knew how to do in your head and then you could expand that to things that were not as obvious. Okay. If we, if we look at the next one, that's not what I meant to do, eraser. Um, if we look at the next one, if you have one mole of aluminum, how many moles of bromine do we need to react with that? Well, if we only have one mole, and every time we use two moles of aluminum is three moles of bromine are used, then we can look at that and say, okay, well, moles of aluminum cancels moles of aluminum. And now we can say, okay, I'm taking my one mole of aluminum, divide by two, multiply by three, And our units that we're left in are moles of bromine. You can see pretty quickly how if I don't give you kind numbers, then you won't be able to see it in your head nearly as well, right? So yeah. writing out these conversions winds up being a really powerful tool that way so that you know you're supposed to divide by two, multiply by three instead of the other way around. And if I, if I start bringing the product instead, how many moles of bromine are required to produce 8.5 mole, 51 moles of the product of aluminum bromide? It's the same basic principle. We're starting in 8.51 moles of aluminum bromide. And we're still going to use those coefficients from up above. So that we want to cancel out moles of aluminum bromide and be left in moles of bromine. Every time we make two moles of our product, that's going to be three moles of bromine used.
moles of aluminum bromide cancel out and we're left in moles of bromine. And we can add these descriptive terms like used or produced just based on whether something is a reactant or a product. If it's a reactant, it's being used up or you need it to make a certain amount. Um, if it's a product, then that's how much you're making. Right, so in this case, we'd wind up dividing by two, multiplying by three, we'd get something like 12.75. All right, so that's the basis for stoichiometry. Like we, we tried to do on the, on the homework, it requires a little bit of practice and um, you might still be getting used to the abstract nature of it, but really it's once it's a balanced reaction, we're just talking about number of objects before and after. And we can set up any, can, any combination of those coefficients that we want. All right, so the, and then the main thing, we'll continue practicing with this. Um, this also allows, allows us to ask a little bit more open-ended questions in terms of if you have a mass of a reactant, we can figure out how much product you can make by taking, starting with your mass of reactant, you can convert that to moles of reactant. And if you're in moles of reactant, you can figure out how many moles product you can make. Right, so a lot of the conversions and a lot of the stuff we're going to be doing going forward is going to be building onto one end or the other of this stoichiometry step. The stoichiometry is this um, taking the coefficients to write a conversion, two doors equals one car. That's stoichiometry. Getting to moles or getting from moles to a mass at the end is the only way that it gets really more complicated. And really all we're doing is we're adding a step where we have to convert from a mass to moles. Right, so if we have a bunch of containers and we want to know how many cars we can make we have four containers we all we know is that one one container is all wheels and it weighs 530 megagrams one container is all doors that weigh 400 megagrams what we would the first thing we would want to do is figure out how many objects we have of each of these because if we can figure out how many objects we have, that's just like finding out how many moles we have for each of these. Then we can say, okay, well, I'm clearly gonna run out of engines first, or I'm gonna run out of wheels first, right? So it becomes sort of a, a logistics issue where it's just a matter of figuring out what runs out first. Um, so I'm not gonna walk through the math here um, I'm just going to put some numbers. So if we, we could do a bunch of conversions where we could say, okay, if I've got, we'll do the first one, I guess, 530 megameters or me, sorry, megagrams and every one megagram is a uh, thousand kilograms, just using those metric prefixes. Then I could say for every 15 kilograms is one wheel. If we do that, that'll give us a number for how many wheels we have, right? So 530 or 5.3 times 1,000 over 15 get 
353 wheels. We did the same thing for these others. We wind up with 160 doors. And Forty three engines. And seven chassis, seven frames. Once we get to the number of objects we have, answering the question at the bottom becomes a lot easier, right? Well, I know I'm not going to run out of wheels because they have 350 wheels and only seven frames. And we can we can show that, okay, if I have seven frames, seven chassis, and for every one chassis, I'm going to use four wheels used. means I'm only going to use at most 28 wheels. Right, because I only have seven chassis, so the most wheels I could use, if I'm putting four wheels per frame, is going to be 28 wheels. The most doors I, could, I would need would be 14 doors. Most engines I would need would be seven engines. So figuring out what's going to run out first and how, how much product I can make winds up being a really useful um, application of this idea. And it does extend beyond this. You, this is the same, the same math that you would do if you were trying to figure out, um, you know, okay, I've, I've got 43 dinner guests and they all want steak. How many pounds of, that's eight ounces, how many pounds of steak do I need to order? It's the same logic. Every steak is eight ounces, and I need X number of steaks. Therefore, how many pounds of meat do I need to order? Right? It's the idea of taking these whole number of coefficients and turning that into a conversion. Right? And so the vocabulary that goes along with this, I know we're pretty much out of time. The vocabulary that goes along with this. Um, is basically just putting, putting scientific names to what's going to run out first, how much can I make, how much, is, how much leftovers do I have. Whatever runs out first, we call the limiting reactant, which makes sense, right? Because that's what's controlling how much product you can make. In our car example, that the number of chassis was the limiting reactants because once we ran out of chassis, we doesn't matter that we had another hundred wheels left or three hundred wheels left. You still can't make a car once you run out of the limiting reactant. Right, so whatever is going to run out first, it's not always what you have least of. If we had seven seven chassis. And um, I don't know, 23 wheels. What's going to run out first? It's going to be the wheels that run out first, right? Even though I have more wheels, I'm using them up four times as fast. So the limiting reactant is not just what you have least of, it's what runs out first. Excess reactant is whatever you don't use. When you run out of the limiting reactant, excess reactant is what are, whatever's left of the other component. So if we said, um, so we have, let's say we have 1.0 moles, we're going to use this reaction right here, 1.0 moles of oxygen. 
And every time I use three moles of oxygen, I use four moles of iron. So if I used all my oxygen up, if all of my oxygen reacts, I'm only going to use 1.33 moles of iron. And I have two moles. So this right here tells us that the oxygen's running out first. The oxygen is the limiting reactant. And with a quick subtraction, it also tells us how much iron we have as excess. If I have 2.0 moles of iron and I'm using 1.3 moles, I'm going to have 0 0.7 moles excess. Right, so common concepts, just putting scientific vocabulary to it and being really methodical and systematic about how we calculate it. That's all stoichiometry is. It just gets tricky to pay attention to the logistics sometimes. And so that's, that's when it's useful to go back to thinking about an analogy. Oh, it's a reactant, so I'm using that up. Therefore, and then that kind of dictates whether you're subtracting numbers. It's um, thinking about the logic of it, right? And then the, the last two terms, I know I'm over time, but I'm just going to, we're not going to do the examples yet, but I want you to see them. The amount of possible product is your theoretical yield. So if you use up all the oxygen and it's, and it's run out, how much product could you make is the theoretical yield. And then last but not least, we could do a percent yield. If you know how much you were supposed to be able to make and you know how much you actually made, the percent yield is just the actual divided by the theoretical, how much we actually made divided by how much we were supposed to be able to make. If I have enough ingredients to make 115 hamburgers, but then I run out of um, lettuce at 95 hamburgers, my percent yield would be what I actually made divided by what I was supposed to make times 100 because it's a percent. All right, so. Does that mean that there's this loss? Is the the, that means that there is loss. In a lot of reactions, you don't actually get 100% yield. You still have all the same mass, but maybe some of it stayed as reactant, or maybe some of it had a side reaction that happened. Right. So frequently we will see reactions where either where you don't get all the way to 100% yield, but even though you still have the same total mass before and after, there's just other junk that happens along the way. All right. So with that, I we will start here when we come back on Wednesday. And as usual, I'm five minutes over. So if you have lab today, um, show up to lab at 3.35 and we will do a quick introduction. I don't think you need too much from me for lab, but we'll go over some of these and maybe do some practice problems too. Uh, and I'll record it for those of you who can't be there. All right, see everybody in a few or on Wednesday. Thank you, Mr. Ryland, have a good afternoon. Thanks as Thank well. you. Yeah.